there's a great sequence in the book, and those of you who have a chance later on to look at it, there's um, a little section for our little Annie family, which has five little vellum overlays, and you get to see a little bit of Kurtzman, Kurtzman's process. And I thought, Dennis, you could talk a little bit about how he worked, which is singularly different than any other cartoonist who worked or does work. Well, the, the overlays are there to dramatize it because you can describe it, and describe it, describe it, but when you actually see it, um, then uh, you understand. Basically, he started with a, a story idea. He would write it out longhand, then he would type it into a manuscript. It had to be approved by Hefner. But once it was approved, he then did tight pencil layouts, which will be the first vellums you see. And uh, if those were approved, then he would take that same basic composition, he would do a watercolor version of it, so that the almost an abstract version of it in color. And then he would do a larger layout in line art that was the size of the finished art, which was roughly that big. And then he went on top of that with yet at least a fourth and sometimes more and he would tighten that up even more so that every single detail you see in the final Annie Fanny is there in an outline form. And then that would be given to Will Elder. So when Will Elder got it, he literally had to trace that onto an illustration board and do the final painted rendering. So when you see the final painted rendering, that's not Harvey's own natural style, but everything there was directed by Harvey. And not just in a rough layout, as many artists will do, go from one rough right to the final, but literally at least four. And there are some where there are multiple uh, overlays on top of overlays. Sometimes a single panel will have two or three different overlays, getting minuscule. Um, so it's crazy in a way, but what you end up with is, I think, the comics that are about as perfect as they can get as a as a, at least in the, the painted form that Annie Fanny is, was the luscious, richest looking comic. Politics aside, I don't think you can find a more beautiful comic because it was the best that Hefner could buy, and he bought the rest of the best talent he could. It wasn't practical for other publishers to use that same technique, nor would uh, they probably have put up with how long it took Harvey and Willie to do these. It was originally envisioned as a monthly, and it quickly became a three or four times a year feature because they literally were producing about a page a month. And, um, yeah, basically, the Lynn Lane thing ran from October 1962 to September 1988. And it's this long process when you look at it in the book and you sort of read about it, you know, the amount of work that went into it. Um, I was working on a book with Al Jaffe once, who does the Foldings and Man, and he had this little portfolio. He had to do one page for Esquire magazine of Elaine's, the restaurant, and Harvey was the uh, commissioned it from him. And he basically got the assignment, he did it, and there's the, the finished piece that he did. And then there's all these other roughs from Kurtzman where he had him do tissue over his sketches, um, different sort of algorithms of you know where the light would hit, where the color, how it should be colored. So the end piece looked nothing like Jaffe's and it didn't actually need to be done by Jaffe. It could have been done by by Harvey, but the amount of work that he put into it and art directing somebody like Adam to do it over and over again, I always found fascinating. And you know that's something I wanted you to talk about too a little bit. Is that and by the way, it wasn't paid by the hour. Right. He did this because he was a perfectionist. And, and one of the things that he did was he pushed people to do over and over again their best work. And these are people who obviously were very talented artists, Jack Davis, um, you know, Will, Will Elder, and, uh, and yet they did it, they did it. And why do you think that is, was it respect for Harvey? Was it just that his layouts were just that much better? Did they just give up? In interviews, most of them have said yes, it's because they respected him. They didn't always agree with him. Um, Adele Kurtzman told me she remembered one time uh, Harvey and Wally Wood arguing behind a closed door <laughs> about a particular layout and Wally Wood bristling at the direction he was given. 
But after, you know, the door was open, and we're okay, and Wally did it Harvey's way, because Harvey was the boss. Um, I think those of us who look at Wally Wood's career with some objectivity would say the stuff he did for Mad Magazine was the best stuff he ever did. And you know, someone, I suppose, could argue that, but there's a vitality to his work there that is from Harvey's direction and layouts. As good as Wally Wood was, when he did work on his own, it was much stiffer looking. looking at it. It, it just wasn't the same. Um, uh, and I think most of the other artists, too, they, they did it out of respect. There were some who famously disagreed with them. I think George Evans uh, was the most vocal uh, when he was doing some of the World War I stories for Two Fisted Tales. And, uh, from what I read in interviews, I thought George must have torn up Harvey's layouts and done it his own way, but when we actually discovered some of the rare surviving layouts, sure enough, uh, even George Evans followed Harvey just about down to every last detail. So, um, I think they sometimes argue, but they lost. And, um, you know, as you're looking at the work, I mean, for me, in going through this book, the thing that I was most struck by, the thing that most impressed me, and you know, the, you know, he was a writer, he was an artist, he was an editor, so he put together, if you look at the first um, 23 issues of Mad, everything from cover to cover is by Kurtzman. Everything that's written is by him. Um, every, every piece of art in there, he art directed, did uh, layouts and, and sort of, over and over again, you know, push them and tweak them until they were exactly right. Um, but the stuff that I, I was always struck by is the stuff that's in his own hand. And yet, you don't see as much of that. You didn't see as much until later on he started doing his own stuff with Lex Sid, but otherwise, it was all Kurtzman interpreted by other people. Did he, you know, early on, just, I don't think any really early surviving stuff. Well, the, most of the early man covers were by Harvey, but you're right, inside, no. The only, the only thing inside the first the 20 some issues of Mad that are in Harvey's own hand solo are the reprints of Hey Look and Punch Up Me. Um, and it was just a matter of time because the things you described, the, the writing and the laying out and the, the editing, this was more than a full time job. Those of us who are big fans of Harvey Kurtzman lament the fact that there aren't more things he did himself. Things like Jungle Book, to me, are just such masterpieces. I would love to have seen Harvey do more. Jungle Books, he had a Jungle Book sequel ready to go, but the first one uh, sold poorly, so he and Valentine pulled the plug. Some of the things he did for Esquire in the late 50s and early 60s are, are magnificent. If you go back and, and look at them, um, it's, again, just a shame that we couldn't have more. But the truth is he had a tough time making a living doing that. And so he had to collaborate and he had to work with what he called slicker artists. So he couldn't have done, say, Lil Annie Fanny himself because Hefner insisted that the final polish be someone who could make Fanny Fanny and have that sort of sexy finished look that Will Logan could do that Harvey could not. Harvey's would have looked more like a Modigliani doing and so uh, it is what it is, and at least we have some wonderful things that Harvey did himself. And uh, can't, we can't change anything except uh, it's, it's the old what if game. And, uh, you know. This piece that's on the screen right now, the one that's followed, you want to tell the story about the, uh, the outtakes there? Well, those are. Uh, bought them, there are these elaborate crowd scenes uh, Harvey did for Pageant Magazine and uh, another obscure magazine around 1950, and the original is the only one that survived, was probably like that bit. He was paid $75 to do it, and uh, the amount of work that went into those is enormous. Uh, I mean, it had to have taken him at least a full week to do one of those. And uh, one of them uh, that ended up in pageant is called Times Square. It's actually a limited edition print some of you may have seen. And it's in the book. But when doing the research, I went back and looked at the pageant. 
and I realized that the Times Square in pageant was not the same one that was hanging on Harvey's wall that we made a print of. In fact, the one hanging on his wall was the reject. So the one in pageant was another one that he had done, he thought a little bit better, and of course, somebody there probably tossed the good one, and he kept the reject. This happened over and over again with his work, where he would do something that, to many of us in this room, would look wonderful, but to Harvey it wasn't good enough, and he would do it over. And he did the same thing with his collaborators. Uh, there are a number of things in the files. Uh, the book had been two volumes, we kept shown them. Uh, but so many times he would have Jack Davis do something, and it would be great, and he'd say, no, do it over, this time in wash, or this time do it over in pen. And you had two virtually identical pieces of art, and Harvey would pick the one he liked best, and the other one was on the time room floor. This happened over and over again. So it was a tough taskmaster, probably not easy to work for. Because again, remember, these guys weren't paid by the hour. This was piece work. And if you look at those pieces, either in the book or when they come up on the screen, you know, the composition, it's, it's the perspective, the amount of work to get the information that they needed to in those scenes is really staggering.